What's good? It's a coach coming up today on the show. We've got UFC 252. Joey O is locked and loaded on which side you should be betting on, Cormier or Miocic. And one of the great voices from Chicago, David Kaplan, joins us to talk about Major League Baseball and the catastrophe that is college football. Also, JBL on finance, why MGM is something you need to keep your eye on. And the Philly Godfather, he might be cashing a lotto ticket for you. What do we mean? We're going to tell you. And the PGA Tour, the final regular season event of the year. Where should you put your money? I'm going to tell you that. The show starts right now. Welcome to the best damn podcast in the universe. We are also the fastest growing podcast in the universe. We're downloaded in over 50 different countries in all 50 states. I would tell you the name, but we're not so sure we have a name right now. You see, there's a little trademark infringement, so we're not exactly sure. We are going to comply with the law. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, so we might have a name. We might not. We may just stay as the best damn podcast in the whole freaking universe, because that's exactly what we are. You can also find us on YouTube. Can't tell you the name there either. Also find us on Twitter. Can't tell you the name there either. Can't tell you the name there either. You obviously found us. So thank you very much. And I'll get right into the reason we are the fastest growing podcast in the whole damn universe. And that is because of the people we have on this show. The best experts in the world. We'll start with who I believe the best sports betting person in the history of this planet. He is Steve Maltepis, the Philly Godfather, 64.8% last year on the NFL. That's all you need to say. Godfather, welcome to the show. Hey, you forgot about that LSU future at 40 to 1. Uh, the San Francisco futures to win the West at plus 300, to win the NFC at 12 to 1. And they, they lost the Super Bowl to the coaches' chief, but we had a ticket at 28 to 1, and we had a great opportunity to hedge some money in that Super Bowl and, and, and turn a profit. But like I said, coach, Congratulations to the Chiefs, but no one's ever going to beat that 64.8% record again, I think, against the spread in the NFL. I didn't forget about those uh, stats, uh, Godfather, because I was fired on every single one of them, <laughs> and I loved every one of them. He is the best combat sports handicapper in the world. Two and one last week on our podcast. He has been absolutely killing it. He goes by so many names. We, <laughs> It's like New York, New York. He's so nice, you got to name him twice. It's Joy Delicious. It's Joy Bagels. It's Bagel Time. It's Joy Odessa. Welcome to the show again, my friend, Mr. Odessa. What's up, JBL? What's up, Coach? PG? What's happening tonight? My man. My man. Speaking of two words, Coach Rule. Coach Rule. That's all you need to know. There's Tiger, there's Phil, and there's Coach. Coach. He is Jonathan Coachman. Coach, how you doing? I tell you what, I got two words for you. Brooks Kepka. Without Brooks Kepka, we go 5-0 and on the podcast last week. But instead, he wants to throw out shade. And karma's a bitch. And it bit him in the ass. And it bit us in the ass a little bit, too. But we didn't. We lost a little juice. But I'm begging him to show up on Sunday. We'll get into that. So instead of 5-0, and you were 4-1. Well, 2-2-1. Two, 2-2-1. Two, two, and one. <laughs> two, two, and one. Yeah, you know, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, 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 yeah, just go ahead. Just go ahead. We were I'll good, with but not, one, it's, it's, not, it's almost the same, but it's completely different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's one of those things, coach. If you don't know the answer, sometimes you don't want to ask a question because I thought you'd go for I was going to put over how great you were because you are a okay. great coach. Thank I won't you. forget the time you told us don't even touch DeChambeau with the 10-foot pole when Kupka was coming in as the favorite to go into the tournament, and you said he's not yep. going to make the cut. All of those yep. hit, Coach. So I'm putting you over like gold because you I are gold. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Coming up, Milchick. And Milchick, Cormier. Milchick fighting at Cormier. Are they the two best heavyweights of all time? Let's ask. Joey Odessa, first of all, before you pick a winner, are those the two best UFC heavyweights of all time? Wow. I mean, going by who they beat, I would have to say, yeah, they are. Um, but, you know, with different generations, I mean, look, uh, you know, people match up different. There's guys that could beat Miosic maybe that, you know, they couldn't beat Cormier. I think that uh, 
Yeah, I guess I, I guess you can make an argument. Cormier is the best heavyweight of all time if he wins this fight. Miosic, I don't know. I've never been sold on Miosic, and you know, going into this fight, I'm not sold on Miosic again. I look, I've been riding Daniel Cormier years ago when he was in the Strike Force Grand Prix. They put him in as an alternate. They they listed the uh, field at fifty to one. I knew Cormier was going to get into that lineup. Guys always get hurt. He got in there, boom, he won a Grand Prix. Then he comes to the UFC. I mean, arguably one of the greatest of all time, if it weren't for John Jones. John Jones beats him twice. Cormier goes up to heavyweight, beats Miosic the first time, just crushes him four minutes and four minutes and change in the first round. Second fight, he goes out there and he's dom. I thought he was dominating for the first two rounds. He was working. He took him down in the first round, working him on the feet in the second round. But that body work, Miosic started playing on him, started adding up. Miosic had to come from behind victory, I would call it, in the fourth round. This is the trilogy at the apex. What, eighth card at the apex? These guys are, uh, you know, it's a smaller cage. Cormier knows what he's got to do here. Knows he's got to wrestle to win it. Also, it's his legacy. So legacy is on the line right here. I think Cormier is going to beat him, and I think Cormier is the greatest UFC heavyweight of all time after this weekend. Two things, Joy, as a follow-up. Uh, the smaller cage, does it make a difference? And you think Cormier beats him. Does that mean he beats him within the distance, you think? Well, I hope he – well, need, going in needing Cormier, I would hope that he finished him inside the distance because, you know, the fourth and the fifth round, both those guys came in lighter for the, for the rematch. Cormier was like nine pounds lighter or eight pounds lighter. Miosic was like ten plus lighter. You know, you would think, wow, the, both these guys are in even better shape than the first fight. But, again – that body work Miosic late early took its toll on Cormier late. I think Cormier realizes these guys are veterans. They're not going to change any big part of their game right now. It's a little too late to learn things like that. But I think that Cormier will come in here with a solid game plan, look to take Miosic down inside the smaller cage, maybe avoid some of those body shots. And I, you know what? It probably I would say it doesn't go the distance. And is a smaller cage, a lot is made about smaller cages. Does it really make that much difference in over-unders and fights being determined? You know, it's such a small sample size that we're looking at. Like last week, half the fights went to decision. The week before that, uh, at the Apex, four of the 12 fights went to decision. It's all relative. Look, you know, matchups, no two guys match up the same. And, you know, it's like you'll, you'll see these trends that come out. And it's tough to have a trend. I mean, look, you could have a 26-0 and 0 boxer fighting a – a 12 and 0, you know, or uh, Vasily Lomachenko, 3 and 0 fighter against a 26 and 0 champion, and the 3 and 0 guy wins. But if you look at statistically, you can make an argument for the guy that's got 26 wins. And in the same case, you know, a guy might have all his wins in a smaller organization. Last week, uh, James was what 16 and 16 and four, and and he was the the flavor of choice for everyone last week. They piled on that kid, brought it almost down to a pick him, and he went out there and he, and he got beat. A guy, Scott Tolksman, same thing. Flavor of choice, you know, statistic-wise, stat-wise, he looked like a really solid play, but no two fights are the same. So to answer your question, I think it makes a difference when the matchup is right. If you have two strikers, if you have a Dominic Cruz against someone else that fights from range, the fight's going to go the distance, whether it's in a small cage or a big cage. I tell you this, the one thing I don't like is the fact that uh, no matter who wins this fight, we're going to have an open heavyweight championship because even Maochis has said this is probably going to be his last fight too. That part I don't like, but I like the trilogy. Now, let's go to a little bit of the other card. Give us two other matchups that you're looking at, Joey, that you really like on Saturday. Well, I mean, the co-main event here, Sean O'Malley, is 12-0. And, and, man, this kid, he's been going out there. He's, he's looked really impressive. He came up Dana White's Contender Series. He's in really tough this week. Last time he fought, he fought uh, Eddie Wineland. And, the, the, you know, the, the popular thought was that Wineland might have been the guy to beat him. More experience. Wineland's got, you know, Wineland also had 12 or 13 losses going into that fight. He had, like, 30 wins. So, I mean, Wineland had been used to being beat, I would say. So it wasn't, and he'd been stopped before three times by KO, three times by submission. So it was a matchup for, for uh, O'Malley to like, to advance. They're bringing O'Malley along right. Right now he's in here with Marlon Vera, who's very, very tough. Vera's only got, a, he's got six losses, he's 17 and six. You know, I don't think O'Malley should be a three to one favorite over him. You know, I'm not, I don't want to preach value, but again, it's another step up for O'Malley. And, oh, I forgot. Coach, Whoa, coach, what did you just value. say? What did you to, just say? I, I know. I'm, you know, the, the word just makes me cringe. And I, I, I said why last week. 
Guys never jump up or down after winning a value bet, but they lose a, a whole bunch of them. But I think that I, I would say that the value is probably on Vera here. Uh, another guy that's really tough here, Junior Dos Santos, that's fight right before him against uh, Rosenstruck. Uh, you know, it's a pick and bow. I think Dos Santos is technically better than him. And uh, Jair's coming off a loss. So, you know, I, Vera, Dos Santos, and D.C. for the money. Very good. Very for good. For the money, I said. Uh, I don't forget, if you're, listen, if you're listening to this podcast, either Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, every time there's a big UFC fight, especially before a UFC pay-per-view, we will have a live show on Twitch. And again, we will give you the address. We don't know what the show's <laughs> going to be called by Saturday, but we'll be there, and we could not be more excited. He is the only Chicago media personality to have a daily radio show a daily television show, and a daily newspaper article. I don't know how he has this many hours in the day, but he is in the Illinois Coaching Hall of Fame. He is in the Chicago Public Schools Coaching Hall of Fame. He is from Cap and Company. He has three Emmys for his television work. He's also an ESPN 100 NBC Sports. He is the man. He is Dave Kaplan. Dave, thanks for coming on our podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Anytime I get to talk to my guy, the Philly Godfather, I'm all in. That's why we're here, too. Hey, Dave, I want to get right away with some breaking news that has come out this week. The Big Ten, the Pac-12 decided they weren't playing football. There is about 50 different professional, albeit professional, sports leagues around the world playing right now, not in a bubble. Chicago, college football, to me, which I love, my favorite sport in the whole world, seems a disorganized mess, lack of leadership. What has gone wrong with college football? And do you agree? Uh, it is a mess. I think they need a czar of college football. They, I think each sport should have a czar. And so you don't have the Mid-American Conference goes, yeah, we're not going to play. And the SEC goes, well, we're going to play. No, nope. there's one person that's at the head of it and makes the best decision based on all the evidence. I listened this afternoon to the head of infectious diseases at Duke University, one of the great universities in the world. And he said, we can absolutely play and keep these guys safe. Is there no risk? No, he said, but there's no risk in anything. You always have risk. When you step on the field, you can get injured. So if this guy at Duke thinks they can do it, what is he reading that the guys in the Big Ten are not reading? Something doesn't make sense to me here. It seems so, like, Cap, it seems like that, that it's a lot of guys that are already in powerful positions that are just really, really scared. And when you look at it now and you hear some of the numbers are staggering, Nebraska would lose over $100 million, Wisconsin over $100 million in your neck of the woods. How in the world do these schools plan on moving forward now? Because this is a finance podcast. Moving forward if they lose one hundred to $150 million just because of this. Yeah, I don't know how you make that up. Like the Chicago Cubs are going to lose. Rough projection is right around $200 million. Jerry Reinsdorf, now they don't draw what the Cubs do with the White Sox. He also owns the Bulls. He said – absolutely going to lose nine figure money. Uh, some of these schools have amazing endowments. They may have to dip into some of those endowments, but you can't tell me that one part of the country says we can pull this off and other parts go, yeah, we can't play. I, it doesn't make sense to me. So what do you think happens cap? Do you think it's a matter of a super conference? Do you think the sec play? You think the big 12 plays? You think it's just sporadic football around the country? Do you think there could be a spring football season? Cause if you play spring football, you got to come right back and play fall football. And most kids and coaches don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. What do you think happens with college football? I just can't believe that you're going to have Nebraska. Who's a member of the big 10 and cash is <laughs> a big 10 network check last year was $33 million that they're going to go, okay, well, guess what? See you later. We're going to go play in the Big 12 for a year, or Ohio State's going to go play in the SEC. I don't know how that happens unless you get all these power schools and they go, hey, NCAA, adios. We're starting our own division, and we're playing for our own championship. I guess it remains to be seen. It's just a really, really wacky way to go about it. Is the lack of leadership, the void of leadership, it was because these big schools are so big. I mean, you basically can't tell Nick Saban anything or Dabo Sweeney or, or, or Harbaugh or any of these coaches anything. They've gotten so powerful. So the NCAA has become pretty inept because they haven't had to be a leader. So, you know, you only need a real jockey when your horse gets in trouble. Finally, the horse has gotten in trouble, and we see that we have no leadership. Is that lack of leadership 
well, going look, to lead to positive going forward? Well, that lack of leadership, I think, is the death knell for trying to see if we can get everybody to come together. You can't have the Pac-12 today says, yeah, we're out. The Big Ten goes, yeah, we're out. But guess what? Two schools in the Big Ten don't want to be out, so they're going to go play somewhere else. Like, it's just a whole mess of crap. I mean, it's amazing to me that we have no guidance, no leadership, but just look at Major League Baseball. you got the worst commissioner of the four major sports. Everyone <laughs> thought it was Gary Bettman. All of a sudden, they've had over 10,000 tests. Every single one of them is negative. They're in a bubble. They're moving on to the next round of the playoffs. Basketball, where they have the best commissioner, they're staying safe. They're playing, allowing us to gamble. Everything's back. And you got Rob Manfred, who I think is a lost ball in high weeds. So uh, I, I don't know how we <laughs> picked this whole thing. Well, your your uh, team, the Chicago Cubs, have benefited from the fact that the St. Louis Cardinals apparently enjoyed going to casinos when they all got COVID. It appears, and they're now two and three. Chicago they hadn't played a game uh, in over a week and may not play for another week or two. What do you think happens with teams like the St. Louis Cardinals and the Philadelphia Phillies? Do you think they play just a very limited number of games, or, or do you think they're going to end up being out of the season? I think that they will try and plow through this and play as many doubleheaders as they can. But I looked at a stat yesterday. As of yesterday, 18 days in, we have 54 pitchers on the injured list, non-COVID-related, mind you. We're talking about injuries sustained on the field of play on the same 18 days in a year ago, it was 26. And the year before that, it was 19. So obviously they did not do a very good job preparing all these guys in a quick two and a half week or whatever it was, spring training 2.0. So we've got big troubles. The Cubs have done the best job managing the coronavirus. They've had zero positive tests since intake day July 1st. And they have a veteran team. And these guys, I've spoken to many of them. Anthony Rizzo's on my show every week. He said, hey, we made a deal among ourselves. We're not going to grocery stores. We're not going out and getting haircuts. They're taking care of everything we could possibly need. Our families have bought in. And that's why the Cubs are sitting at 10 and 3 and a chance to maybe get on a little run here. And, Cap, it's good to see that uh, you bought into the no haircut thing, too, with the rest of the Cubs uh, right as there, well. Baby. Now, I, I got to ask you this, because – here on this show, we just fire. We just fire. We just fire. With all the sports that are going on, uh, it has allowed for a lot of overs with the lack of pitching coming in in baseball, I feel, which has been amongst your listeners there in Chicago, the third biggest uh, media market in the country. With with the soccer, we fire on soccer, baseball, now basketball. What's been the most favorite uh, sport to bet on, in, in your opinion? You know, it's amazing that people are really into betting on golf here. They're betting on baseball, but golf betting, we got some guy here in the Chicago area, he bets like a month ago on Colin Morikawa. He wins $1.1 million at wow. Rivers Casino at, at, at Open by the Airport by O'Hare. And so this weekend, he goes on Twitter, just letting you know I've got some stupid ticket, like twenty grand at Colin Morikawa again. Oh, and no. Again, and wins another million dollars. Wow. So golf's gotten real popular. Look, I like football. My friend, the Philly Godfather, has tried to teach me how to look at advantages and disadvantages and looking at line play. I never really looked at, well, wait a minute, that offensive line is going to be able to dominate that D line. I need to take a look at that game closer. So I'm waiting for football to get back, but I have fun. Just throw a few dollars and have a good time. Gap, as a Chicago Cup fan, you don't want anybody to ever get COVID except for maybe Billy Sionis's goat. Maybe, you know, that might have killed the Cubs <laughs> curse a while back. You guys finally got over that curse. I don't know why the hell the guy brought a goat to the stadium anyway. But the Cubs right now, first place, you talk about how good they are with the COVID. Do you think they're able to hang on? Are they, they going to be the World Series champions? Or how far do you see your Cubs going? Well, they've got a really good team. They've got to stay healthy. The thing they don't have is a lockdown closer. I mean, literally, Craig Kimbrell stinks. He looks <laughs> awful. And this is a guy they offered a contract last year for $43 million. And he's still throwing hard. He's hitting 97. So the velocity's there. But he's got to be tipping pitches because he throws some nasty curveballs. And they just look at him and just watch them sail out of the strike zone. So I think they know what's coming. They've got to find a way to get somebody at the back end of the pen that they can hand the ball to and know 
that guy's closing it out 98% of the time. I saw Kimbrell when he walked the about 18 batters and hit about 17. Yeah, I had a smoke that night. I'm recovering nicely. <laughs> oh, my God. And the Cubs <laughs> end up winning that night. Uh, thank God. Philly Godfather had me bet on the Cubs, and I was starting to question him for just a second. But <laughs> thank goodness that they end up winning, even though Kimbrell almost blew. Well, see, JBL got so Kimbrell, caught up that he can't even have- – let me pick it up because JBL, sometimes he gets so excited that he freezes cap uh, as we wrap up. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show as we move forward now. And we're talking specifically about major league baseball and I'm watching and I know you were for ESPN. I used to be there all the blowhards this morning on first take say there's no chance of baseball. There's no chance that NFL. How many of these sports do you think other than NBA, which is going to finish will, will ultimately finish their seasons. I think you'll see the NHL finish, as you said, the NBA will finish, and Major League Baseball will finish. I remain a little skeptical of what's going to happen in the NFL. Look, the Bears have done a really good job so far. A lot of their their veteran team, they've done a really nice job at their COVID protocols. But if you can't have players take it seriously, like the two idiots that pitch for the Cleveland Indians that sneak out of the hotel – and then one of them, Clevenger, gets on the team flight knowing he violated yeah. the protocol. And by the way, his teammate who's on the flight with him freaking had leukemia a year and a half ago and is still taking his medicines. And that guy doesn't tell anybody? He's a jackass. So do I believe that every NFL player is going to adhere to the protocols? Sadly, probably not. So I'm a little skeptical on NFL. I hope it plays. But the other three, I think, finish. All right. Very good. We look forward to you coming back on the show. We look forward to seeing all your videos. I personally hope the Cubs start to suck because you're a lot more entertaining on Twitter (laughs) when they don't play well. With very ladies, that's David Kaplan from Chicago. Cap, thank you very much. Anytime. I love being out with you guys. Tell my guy, the Philly Godfather, he's the king. So college football may or may not play this fall. We just don't know yet. But let's bring in JBL now for our finance section of the show. And you've been hitting hot on stocks and all these different topics when it comes to finance and sports betting, specifically coming off the college football news this week. How do you think that, JBL, is going to affect sports betting? Well, it's going to hurt, Coach. Uh, you, you look at what happened when they first made the announcement that the Big Ten, the Pac-12, may opt out of the fall football season, whether they're going to play in the spring, whether they're going to play not next year. It doesn't really matter. Sportsbooks got, took a pretty big hit. You had down 5 to 10%. You talk about uh, Penn Gaming, William Hill, DraftKings. They all got hit pretty hard. The one stock that didn't, Coach, is the one I want to talk about. We talked about it earlier, and this is MGM Grand. Uh, this is the same reason that I like stocks like Disney say over Netflix because Disney's all about streaming. So Disney should compete with Netflix on a valuation of streaming alone. And if you do that, look forward to that, then you have the theme parks, you have the television, all the ESPN stuff. Basically you're getting for free. If you take the assumption that their streaming is going to be as big as Netflix, which most people think it is. MGM is much the same way. You look at, say, DraftKings, valued at right now at about $11-plus plus billion. They're going to have about $700 million in revenue next year if the year ends up like it should with the COVID and all of this. You know, sports are still playing. We may not have college football. That's going to hurt significantly. As long as you have NFL and all the other sports taking the place, it's not going to be a, a death knell for these sports books. They're, they're making a lot of money right now on online betting. Bill, Barry Diller, who had Match.com, also Tinder, which I understand that Joy Delicious has been all over for a long time. He's the cover I'm boy. Kidding. He's the cover boy. <laughs> Ooh, man, these two, and mainly because of Joy Delicious's Tinder profile, sold for like $3.9 billion. All this. So they had a ton of cash. They're looking for a place to put it. Barry Diller cuts that comes out. He's one of the best most media savvy investors of all time. Says that MGM is the investment of a lifetime. So he put a billion dollars in MGM Grand. There's a lot of talks about going on what's on in Macau right now, where you have the huge Asian betting economy hub as far as right there in, in Southeast Asia. But what is and what's going on in Vegas, you can't bet on how COVID's going to play out. You can bet on how people are going to sports bet. And right now you have 42 states that appear to be legalizing sports betting. 
by the end of 2021. Coach, I think this is a massive opportunity. I think MGM, I think if you see college football bow out completely, say the SEC drops out, say the Big 12 drops out, you're going to see this stock take a, a hit. This is all future earnings. They, Barry Diller said earnings were so small in MGM sports betting that you could round it down to zero. It didn't really matter. This wow. is all about potential earnings that are coming. That's why I think MGM is probably the best betting stock to get out there. The best betting company, in my opinion, is DraftKings. But I think the stock has gotten a little bit ahead of itself. Yeah, real quick, you mentioned DraftKings, and in the last week and a half, uh, an organization that I, of course, work with, the PJ Tour, they signed a huge deal with DraftKings. They had a smaller one, but now they have a real comprehensive, and they're going to be calling it the official betting site of the PGA Tour. When you start to do that, I hate to put you on the spot here, when you start to do that, make it a bigger partnership, how, that, how can that help the PGA Tour, but also how can that help DraftKings? By viewership, uh, you, you look at the PGA Tour, and it's so fun to bet on matchups. And Coach, you and the Philly Godfather, Las Vegas Wolf, have been excellent in what you've done as far as breaking down matchups, giving those matchups out. But you look at the PGA Tour, and say you're you're not a Brooks Kupka fan or a Shambo fan, you're a Tiger or a Phil fan. As long as they make the cut, you're able to bet on them throughout the weekend yeah. because you can bet on matchups that they have. You bet on golfers' matchups based upon course, about how they're playing, what's going on as far as you know in their personal lives. It makes the sport so much more interesting. And you're starting, that's why you're starting to see from, from Disney, from MGM, from Caesars, all these different sports books are tying up with somebody creating these conglomerates because they understand that the whole is much better than the sum of its parts, especially when you're talking about sports betting to sports. There's nothing worse than a blowout game unless you have the over. And then you're thinking, oh, my God, you got to get one more touchdown. You got to get one more goal. It makes sports so much more interesting, at least in my opinion, and, and the opinion of a lot of America. Yeah, you bring up a lot of good points, JBL with the finance. And, and as you talk about golf and you talk about the matchups and whenever you pick a winner, it's almost like picking a lottery ticket. You heard Kaplan say earlier in the show that when you bet on Colin Morikawa, then you win a million dollars if you put 15 or 20 grand. Winning that lottery ticket, getting a long shot. I mean, there aren't very many people in the sports betting world that can hit those. Who could that, that be, us, Coach? Coach, who I, could I, that be? I don't, I don't know, but I think his name is the Philly Godfather, and we here just call him the Godfather. And we bring him in out of the show. Godfather, when you talk about hitting a lottery ticket and you talk about getting a number that at the time seems like, what? But then it starts to play itself out. What do you have for us this week? Yeah, well, last Tuesday night, if you guys remember, um, I was going through my various, you know, betting accounts, you know, where I bet Major League Baseball. And the one team that stuck out at me was the Miami Marlins at 100-1 to one to win the division. So I started betting it, and I sent it out to you guys. And I, I know you guys thought I was joking around and kidding around about it. But the reason why it was so advertising to me and the reason why I nibbled on it was the fact that the Braves just lost their, their ace. They lost the Roker for the season, tore an ACL against the Mets on the previous night. And if you guys remember and rewind the last year, uh, Soroka was a huge reason why the Braves were so successful. Soroka went 13-4. and four. He had a real solid ERA. I think it was right around 2.6. Uh, he earned a spot in the All-Star game, finished second in NL Rookie of the Year balloting, and sixth in the Cy Young Award. So this year, he was supposed to be their ace in 2020. And now you lose him. So I automatically did the math, and I told myself he should be worth at least three to four wins to the Braves teams, uh, to this Braves team above replacement uh, in this abbreviated short season. And so considering the fact that the Braves had a, a, a projected Vegas win total set at 33 and a half before the season started, this loss is massive here in a division that I think is completely wide open for the taking right now. His loss could, could make this Braves team – a 500 ball club, or even a sub 500 team. If you look at that, you know, initial Vegas projected winter at 33 and a half, and now you lose your ace who could be worth three, four games. I mean, this thing is wide open. And at that point in time, uh, last week, the Phillies, the Mets, the Nationals, they weren't scaring anybody. Their, their bullpens were actually horrible. And the reality is they're not scaring anybody anybody right now, these three teams. They have a combined record right now, the Phillies, the Mets, and the Nationals, of 17-23 and 23 with a run differential of negative 24. 
So if you make the Braves a 500 ball club and you look at the surrounding teams in the NL East, this ticket at 100 to 1 definitely has a shot. I mean, the Marlins came out, they impressed me early a little bit. Uh, they started off the season 2 and 1 versus the Phillies, who have one of the best offenses in baseball. Uh, and the, if you guys remember, the Phillies had almost seven more wins on their projected Vegas win total um, than, the, than the Marlins did. Uh, and in those three games, the Marlins scored 17 runs on this on my Philadelphia Phillies team. So they started off two and one. Then they got red hot. They won five in a row. They lost the last two against the Mets. But uh, I went back to last year, and I always go backwards to go forwards. And I remember the Marlins lost. They might have lost close to like 26 or 27 games last year by one run. So I know they lost a ton of games last year. I think they lost 100 games on the season. But they were in a lot of tight games. This year they improved their offense. They got a, young, a lot of young arms on that team. And so I took a shot. Now, it wasn't a massive bet at 100 to 1, but it's a bet that could yield a massive payout. Uh, if you look at the current odds in the NL East, it's the only division right now where you can grab plus money on any team. It's completely wide open. The Braves currently are plus 110 to win the division. The Nationals are plus 350. The Phillies are plus 400. Uh, the Mets are plus 450. And you can still find the Marlins anywhere from like plus 1,500 to 20 to 1. So I still think it offers a little value, even at 20 to 1. Now, it would have been great if we gave it out last week. I wanted to, but we gave out something else at 100 to 1 when we bet it. But at, at 20 to 1, like, like, like Joey says, uh, it does have a little value there. Uh, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> it's still, obviously, it's still a little early. Uh, with only 25% of the season uh, has been completed for a lot of these teams. But if you look at the Marlins' remaining schedule, they still have 50 games left because of the whole COVID mess that started early. But uh, the only two teams that scare anyone on their schedule are the Yankees and the Braves. They play three games against the Yankees, which ain't much. And, again, the Braves lost their starter. So they're going to be playing, I, I, I mean, a 50-50 squad uh, for 10 games throughout the season. Now, with the, like I said, with the Braves losing their ace pitcher, the only true powerhouse left on their schedule is this New York Yankees team. 56 with a minus 21 run differential. And that includes the Braves who are 11 to seven and the Yankees who are uh, 10 and six. So uh, I, I think at hundred to one where we got that ticket, it's massive. The bottom line here is if the Marlins can win 50% of their remaining games versus teams with a current combined win percentage of 46%, they're going to win 32 games on the season. And that might be enough to win the division. This division's wide open at 100 to 1. We had to bet it. At 20 to 1, you can still bet it, you know, small. It's been a crazy 2020. Anything can happen. But in 2020, strange is the norm. So don't be surprised if the Marlins down the stretch are competing for the division. Now, if they are with like 10 games left, you can start hedging against them and still turn a profit. So I thought it was a great bet at 100 to 1. It got a shot. It's been a crazy 2020. And don't be shocked if the Marlins win the NL East. Billy Godfather, you know, when you sent that pic to us last week, I normally send a picture back of Wyatt Earp. I sent a picture back of George Patton because <laughs> I needed I needed a tank in a <laughs> Northern African battle with Rommel. That's how much I was firing. The, the Marlins themselves, though, how in the world do you handicap this team? I mean, they're playing with half their double-A squad. I mean, how do you explain the record that they're having, or can you? Is it just a matter of charisma on this team and chemistry it's, it's on this team? A, it's the pitching, uh, John. They got Lopez, they got Alcantara, and Hernandez. I think all three have a, a, either a one uh, 1.0 whip or lower. Uh, their ERA is is 1.35, 1.80. So these young arms, if they don't get tired, it's, it's an abbreviated 60-game season. So – most of the time, you see a lot of young arms get tired during the end of the season. But with 60 games, these young kids might stay fresh, and they might just pull it through. And, and, and their offense, you got Aguilar on there hitting home runs. you got Anderson. you got a couple other guys on that offense that, I mean, you know, once these teams get hot, they can go on a 10-20 game run. You saw what the Nationals did last year in those two big runs in August and September that carried them through the playoffs. But, again, all this team has to do – is when 50% of the remaining games against teams with a sub-500 record to win a division. At 32 wins, I think you can, you can sneak away with the NLE. 
Uh, amazing, amazing pick, <clears throat> amazing bet. The Miami Marlins, uh, pro- probably the story of Major League Baseball right now. Uh, a great story last week with Marikawa coming out and, and at 23 years old, winning the PGA Championship. The drive on 16 is going to go down in infamy like several great shots of all time. Coach, uh, you watched uh, every single day. You're going to the Wyndham uh, Golf Tournament this weekend out of the Carolinas. What do you got for us this week, Coach? Yeah, it was really an honor last week to be a part of the PGA Championship, be their keynote speaker the day before, and have them on the, the background behind me. And what an incredible week it was. And uh, Anybody that was would have had more Kawa before the tournament started, uh, they certainly would have cashed a big-time ticket. But now we've got to turn our, our attention, guys, this week to the final regular season event uh, before we get to the FedEx Cup playoffs. And a couple of things that people at home need to be careful about. Normally in years past, This has been a tournament that the top flight players just didn't bother going to. But because of the restart and because of the condensed schedule, guys like a Brooks Kepka, a Jordan Spieth, a Webb Simpson, they are playing this week. And the reason for that is because now there's only three FedEx uh, Cup events. There's no longer four. So you're going to go from the top 125 the first week all the way down to the top 70 the second week. So every single point matters but we're not touching any of them this week. What I want people to focus on is those guys between 110 and 125 that have to play well. People are always tweeting me, JBL, that they want a couple of picks on winners. Give me a couple of winners. And we always preface it by saying it's like finding a needle in a haystack. But I've got two names this week that I think have value. Luke List, he's been playing really good golf under the radar. He is 10 plus 10,000. So on a $100 bet, if he wins this week, you win $10,000. It's not out of the realm of possibility. The guy that I really think has a great shot is a guy by the name of Tom Lewis. Most people say, Tom who? Two weeks ago at the World Golf Championship, he was in the top five all the way to the 16th hole on Sunday. Now, last week, he shot an opening 67 at the PGA Championship, had a bad Friday. Ultimately, he missed the cut. But he is 120th, 120. So he has to play those week, play well this week. And he's plus 6,000. So a $100 bet will bring you back $6,000 on a guy who has to play well. Now, here's three tournament matchups. Again, I wouldn't touch the big names. I just wouldn't because if they have a bad Thursday and a Friday, their motivation is going to be very low come the weekend. Here's three names that I love this weekend. At 125, Charles Schwartzel who just got his temporary tour card because he had been hurt for a couple of years. Very emotional when he made the cut last week because now he's got his tour card for next year. Take him at plus 165 against Bud Colley. Love that tournament bet. Love Rory Sabatini. He's 113 in the FedEx Club standings. Take him at minus 110 over Doc Redman. And my final bet this week at 120th, I love Tom Lewis going against the young kid from Texas, Dylan Fratelli. This is about motivation. This is about guys that need to make the top 125. And keep in mind, even if they don't, guys, because of the way COVID has attacked everything the PGA Tour is doing, they're not going to lose their card. But there's a lot of cash to be won if they make it to the FedEx Cup playoffs. So there's a lot of motivation to make it. And you don't want to be sitting at home for the next three weeks uh, on the outside looking in when other guys are play, you know, playing for millions and millions of dollars. So those would be my five, two winners and those three tournament bets this week, JBL. Coach, what is your mindset when you look at an entire PGA roster for a tournament? How do you decide the matchups? I know you can look at certain players that may play certain golf courses better. You may have motivation because of where they are and stand move up. But how do you decide who you match them against? How do you look at an entire roster and go, okay, these are the three matchups that I want against these three people? Well, that's a great question. And a lot of times I'll look at three different sports books. I have accounts with three different places and and they all have different matchups. And so you've got to go in and say, not not necessarily who's got the best number, but you got to say, who has that matchup? Because normally you're going to have a matchup with a guy that you're in the group with on Thursday and Friday. But then there's some sports books that will put a matchup like a Brooks Kepka against a Webb Simpson, and they may not be playing together because the matchup is closer to like a minus 110. And let's be honest, every sports book, they want to make the juice. They don't want to lose on a long shot. So they like to put those better players uh, together. 
on weeks like this. It's about motivation. It's about flying West Coast to East Coast. Now, PGA Tour, PGA Tour is doing a great job of giving them a charter flight. So it's not like how we all fly every single day. But when you go from a major championship and all the energy is sucked out of you, and then you have to go re-tee it, and your future earnings for the next month or two are on the line. To me, this week, it's all about motivation, and that's it for me when it comes to betting. Coach, I don't know how you fly, but and I'm not sure how Philly Godfather flies, but I know how he rolls. The man lives on an estate, has about a thousand different, like, all kinds of crazy exotic cars, zoo animals all over. He <laughs> stayed all the time on Twitter. So the, the guy, he's just living large. We all want to be Philly Godfather. So I want to ask you, Philly Godfather, what have you got this week that's coming up that you're looking forward to as far as baseball, basketball? What's what's you're looking forward to that's going to be fun for you to watch this week? You know, you know, it's crazy, and I haven't really gotten into it for years. I took a little nibble on the Flyers last month at 11-1 to to win the Stanley Cup, so I'm fired up right now. I'm getting into <laughs> hockey. I can't believe I got ice futures. Uh, it hasn't happened in a while, but this Flyers team, I mean, they've been playing lights out. I think – they, they had the ninth least amount of goals in the NHL. I got the numbers right here because I knew you were going to ask me something about it. Uh, ninth <laughs> least amount of goals in the NHL this year. Fourth best puck differential. Uh, they got they had the fifth in, in hockey. But the way they've been playing, they've been playing so cohesive. And they don't have, like, a major star or two major stars. They got a team of all solid players. And Carter Hart, that goalie, that young kid, he looks unstoppable. I mean, they beat – the other day we beat we bet the Flyers and under they played Tampa Bay and they ended up winning four one we went under five and a half. This is a team to watch out for. We took I took them at eleven to one a month ago and now they're the co favorite to win the whole darn thing to hoist the Stanley Cup. They're at six to one. Watch out for the Flyers, man. I, I can't believe I'm talking about hockey, but I'm betting <laughs> hockey, John. Uh, you talk about another Philadelphia team, the Seventy Sixers. The Ben Simmons is he out now or if, if he yeah is, he's, what done. Happens? he's done he's done. What happens is, does that kill the 76ers' chance? I mean, how, I think so. I mean, we doubled at 22 to 1, 20 to 1. Uh, they didn't impress me much, even when he was playing. He looked a little banged up. Uh, what, what you can't look for now is to look to maybe play the unders, even though all these games seem to be going over because he pushed the pace so much for that Sixers team. Now you got someone else running point. So it might slow the game down a little bit. Really depends on when Embiid's playing, how many minutes Embiid's going to play. Because when he gets the ball, he slows the clock down. They don't push it as fast. Uh, but, yeah, I think he killed – that That Futures take is dead. You might as well rip it up. Hey, Johnny, real quick, to, to piggyback what Godfather said, I think there's a reason for the, uh, the fact that a lot of these teams that play quickly – are uh, going over almost every single game, it feels like every single game, is because they're playing in the same two gyms every single day. And when you get used to playing in your gym, it's just like when you play at home, usually your points per game are higher than when you play on the road. Everybody's playing in the same two gyms every single day, and they love these gyms. They're smaller gyms, so it's not like shooting uh, in a big dome. So if people are, are planning on betting because in the next week, the playoffs begin. And it's been a really fun NBA bubble to look into, but be very careful of the unders because these teams are shooting very, very well. Yeah, me and Jay Brown talked about the depth perception and how that affects these shooters. They're definitely shooters, gyms. But you got to remember the market always corrects itself. So the odds makers are going to just start inflating these prices. And eventually they're going to go too high, then the unders will start cashing. So just be careful. If you miss the early curve, you don't want to get on that train too late because it could cost you some money. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, sh- Chicago, uh, Wrigley Field, uh, the unders have passed uh, about 50% since 2011, since the book started adjusting to the wind so much. Yeah. So you're and right ahead up. of the curve, behind the curve. Yeah. Speaking of a man right. that's ahead of the curve and the most watched profile of all time, Joey Odessa, what have you got coming up this week? UFC 252, man. I just uh, – Daniel Cormier for the money. I mean, uh, he, for his legacy. For wow. history. I mean, they're both, both fighting for their legacy. I guess if Stipe retires after this. But, you know, again, I think uh, we're going to have a repeat of the first two rounds and Cormier is going to get there. Joe, who's just that? Just hands up. Real quick, who dominated the most, around, most amount of rounds so far uh, with the two fights? I know the one time he got caught with that short was a right hook uh, – Cormier hit him with that short right hook, dropped him, it was over. But who's actually dominated, in your opinion, 
uh, the most amount of rounds. Oh, Cormier. Cormier, without a question of a doubt. I mean, he won the first round. He finished him in the first round of the first meeting. Second meeting, he, he won the first two rounds fairly convincingly. Took Miosic down in the first round. Uh, second round, I thought he won. Third round was a little bit closer. There's some of that body work Miosic was, you know, hitting him with, started taking its toll late. But then, uh, you know, Miosic stepped it up. I, I was baffled. I didn't understand why Cormier, like, insisted on fighting Miosic's fight. I mean, I know that's a, you know, it, it's kind of cliche to say that, but he did. He just, yeah, I don't know why he decided to stand with him when that was, in my opinion, Miosic's only path to victory. I mean, the wrestling pedigree between the two of them is night and day. I mean, we have, a, you know, an NCAA All-American, uh, Olympic, you know, Olympic team member against the guy that wrestled for in a tough division in the EWL for Cleveland State, but never really did anything. Won the, won the Ohio Golden Gloves for whatever that was worth, but why would you stand with a guy like that? I guess he wanted to prove something, and what he proved was that Miosic was a formidable opponent. And, you <laughs> he know, could punch. He could yeah, punch. he could punch. I, I think I saw a video that he posted this past week, and I think he's taking this matchup very, very seriously. Uh, he posted a video from April when he was very out of shape, and just recently, it looks like he's in the best shape that he's been in in several years. And I think he put on too much weight when he went up to heavyweight because he thought he needed it. But it, against a guy like Miocic, you don't need to be 250 or 260. And I think we're going to see a Daniel Cormier that's in tremendous shape, that's taking this very seriously. And I think we're all going to make a lot of money on Daniel Cormier come Saturday night. But just going to so. fire, fire, fire. Hey, so. Daniel, hey Coach. Quick, what you yeah. Real quick, uh, Tiger Woods this past week, playing up in the cool in the Bay Area, his bad back. He didn't finish the tournament very strong. Uh, is his back that bad? His putting seemed to be one of his problems, but can he finish a major tournament? Oh, no, I actually I actually uh, texted with a guy very, very close to him, and he actually Sunday played 67, uh, shot a 67, and part of the problem was he couldn't get the greens. And we talked about it last week right here on the show. I said, don't bet Tiger Woods because he had, he'd only played once since February. But now his back was good. He made it through four rounds. He's going to take this week off, and then he's going to play in the first event of the FedEx Cup. I think we're going to see him win this fall. I don't know if it's going to be one of the majors. We still have a U.S. Open, and the Masters in November is going to be amazing. But I think Tiger will start to play more, and you're going to see him contend this fall for sure, for sure. All right, that's going to do it for us. Once again, uh, it's a sports betting podcast. If you can think of a name, hey, send us a tweet. Send us an Instagram <laughs> post. We've got to come up with something. But as always, it's all about the content, and it's never about the name. Thanks for hanging out with us. For the Philly Godfather, for Joey O, for JBL, and thanks to Cody the Kid for stepping in as our producer this week. I'm the coach. Remember, just five, five, five.